How ice was made in the past is directly connected to the harvesting of natural ice and the topic of the ice trade, which occurred in the 19th and 20th centuries. Prior to the 19th century, ice has been collected and stored for later use in many parts of the world, but never on an industrial scale. In the Mediterranean and South America, there was a long history of collecting ice from the Alps and the Andes during the summer months. Akkadian tablets from around 1750 BCE attest to ice houses built for storing ice collected in the winter for use in summer drinks, and from the 16th century wealthy Europeans built ice houses to store and cool drinks and food for those who could afford it. There were also primitive artificial means to cool drinks. In India, clay pots containing water were laid out on top of straw in shallow trenches. With luck, thin ice would form on the surface during winter nights, which could then be harvested for sale. But this ice was of poor quality and resembled soft slush. Saltpeter or sulfuric acid could also be used to chill liquid, but was not capable of producing actual ice. The modern ice trade began in 1806 as a result of the efforts of a New England entrepreneur named Frederick Tudor. At this time, ice houses were relatively common for the wealthy, but too expensive for common use. Tudor wanted to export ice as a luxury good to the West Indies and southern US states where they could find good use of it during sweltering summer months. Many obstacles faced these early attempts to make ice at an industrial scale. For natural ice to reach consumers, first it had to be harvested frozen from ponds or rivers, and then transported and stored at a variety of sites before it could finally reach its place of use. Throughout these processes, traders faced the constant problem of trying to stop their profitable cargo from quite literally melting away. To produce ice for consumption, it had to be cut first. The ice needed to form to at least 18 inches thick before harvesting, as it needed to support the weight of workers and horses, and be suitable for cutting into large blocks. Clear and hard ice was the most valuable, as it was typically consumed at the table, while opaque ice was less valuable and used by the industry. With the ice decently thick, they could harvest around 1,000 tons from just one acre. As demand grew though, natural sources were proving insufficient in some areas. Low-lying boggy land was dammed and then flooded to meet surge demands, and artificial mill ponds, like those in Wisconsin, turned out to be ideal for harvesting ice. In addition, massive artificial lakes up to half a mile long were built in Alaska, the Aleutian Islands, Norway, and in other places. The process of ice cutting had several stages and was typically done at night when the ice was at its thickest. First, the surface would be cleared of snow with scrapers, the depth of the ice tested for suitability, and then the lines would be marked out on the surface to be cut out. The size of the blocks cut varied, the largest being for long distance shipping and the smallest being for nearby destinations. Ice harvesting needed a range of equipment, including what was needed to safely operate on ice, like shoes made of cork for the men, and spiked horseshoes. Early on, only improvised tools like pickaxes and chisels were used for the process, but by the 1840s there were new designs like horse-drawn ice cutters resembling plows that replaced handsaws. By the 1850s there were specialist ice tool manufacturers with entire catalogs of their products. A warm winter could be crippling though, resulting in shortages of ice called ice famines, including several famous ones in the US during the 1880s and 90s. The legalities of the ice trade were quite interesting as well. At the start there were few restrictions, as ice was seen as holding little value. However, as the trade expanded, the right to cut it became important. This often resulted in disputes like ice being washed downstream a river, resulting in arguments over the ownership of the frozen water. In the winter of 1901, for example, a dispute between two companies over the right to harvest ice resulted in pitched battles between workers and the deployment of a steamship icebreaker to smash competing ice supplies. After harvesting, ice had to be moved where it would be used without it melting in the process. Quite a difficult feat given the technology of the time. Ships were the main method of moving ice before railroads were commonplace. Ice was packed together as close as possible, with sawdust, hay, and pine tree cuttings used to insulate them. Ice carrying ships had to be strong, and have a good crew capable of moving cargo quickly before it melted. By the late 19th century, the typical American vessel carrying ice was wooden hulled to avoid rust, with bilge pumps to remove excess water, and carried around 600 tons of ice. Ice cargoes tend to cause damage in the long term to the ship, as the constant water and steam encourage dry rot. Ice needed to be loaded quickly, and initial methods were crude, involving ice tongs and a whip. But by the 1870s they were using a levered platform, and later a counterweighted platform by 1890. In US ports an average ice cargo can be loaded in just two days. 
Ice was also moved by railroad from 1841, starting with special insulated railroad cars. It was not a popular cargo to workers, though, due to the awkwardness of loading and transport. However, by the 1880s, ice was shipped by rail across the entirety of North America. Finally, taking ice from large centers to smaller customers was typically done by using an ice wagon. In the US, ice was cut into 25, 50, and 100 pound blocks. An ice man delivered ice to households daily, or twice daily once the industry grew large enough. In the 1820s and 30s, as little as 10% of ice harvested was able to reach the end user due to wastage during the transportation process. By the end of the 19th century, however, wastage was reduced to 20 to 50% of the cargo, depending on the company. The storage of ice is a serious concern, too. Ice harvested in winter months needed to be kept throughout the summer so it could be sold for profit. Our understanding of thermodynamics was limited at the start of the 19th century. As a result, many ice houses were built underground at significant expense, under the belief it would keep them better insulated. With the ice trade, ice houses were built above ground with inner and outer timber walls insulated with peat and sawdust, with some sort of ventilation system. Later designs were built in brick to help avoid risks of fire, which, despite what you might expect, ice houses were extremely flammable, and many caught fire, including Sydney's first ice house, which was completely destroyed in 1862. Ice houses grew into huge warehouses, which were typically painted white or yellow in order to reflect the sun's heat. A typical Hudson River warehouse could be three stories high and hold up to 50,000 tons of ice. Loading heavy ice blocks to such a height was quite difficult. Initial systems used levers in horse-drawn pulleys, later advancing to steam power and conveyor belt systems. Beyond commercial storage though, people who used ice needed a way to store it without it melting. And this is where the ice box comes in. Ice boxes were actually called refrigerators by the public, and it was only after the invention of the modern electric refrigerator did these non-electric refrigerators become known as ice boxes. Initial ice boxes were just boxes of wood lined with metal with a block of ice on top. Later versions were lined with insulating material and designed to allow proper air circulation, and would have methods of draining melted ice water. The advent of mass refrigeration, thanks to the natural ice trade, revolutionized the world. The long distance transport and storage of perishable items like meat, vegetables, and fruit out of season turned many of them from luxuries into something the common man could afford. However, the natural ice trade and harvesting industry was rapidly replaced during the early 20th century by artificial ice plants. By 1914, 26 million tons of plant ice was being produced in the US, compared to 24 million tons of natural ice. There was a short rise in demand during World War I, but after the war the natural ice industry collapsed, and the world turned completely to plant ice. The introduction of cheap electric motors resulted in the modern electric refrigerator becoming common in most US homes by the 1930s and widely across Europe in the 1950s, and thus ended the ice trade. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button, and if you want to see more, subscribe to my channel to see when my videos are released. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of my other videos on my channel. Anyways, have a nice day.